Galur Elode i Drevn, a Retem Genta, Arnagenda Pranaunama, you questionnaire Prevenidog, our question Genta David Melding. Um, will the First Minister make a statement on the budget of Rent Smart Wales? Yes, Rent Smart Wales uh, is self financing through fees. We do, however, support local authorities to promote and enforce registration with Rent Smart Wales. First Minister, according to the uh, Freedom of Information request, request put forward by the Residential Landlords Association, Rent Smart Wales is currently operating at over double its projected cost. At the end of February 2017, it had hired 50 full time equivalents to administer <coughs> the scheme, which is five times the projection of your regulatory impact assessment. Was the Welsh Government naive in its estimates of the administrative cost of Rent Smart Wales, or was inefficiency at Rent Smart Wales to blame? Well, as I said, RentSmart Wales is entirely self-financing. It's paid for through the fees for registration and licensing of landlords and uh, agents. It's a matter for RentSmart Wales, of course, which is run by uh, Cardiff uh, Council, uh, to uh, explain its operating costs and uh, what it does uh, with the personnel that it has. Vicky Howells. Dear Clareth. First Minister, how does the work of Rent Smart Wales help towards supporting the most vulnerable members of our society who live in private rented accommodation? Well, Rent Smart Wales ensures that anyone involved in the letting and management of properties is both fit and proper and trained. The fit and proper person test makes sure that nobody with unspent criminal convictions can have any involvement with a tenant particularly important, of course, when dealing with vulnerable tenants. And training ensures that a landlord or agent is aware of their legal responsibilities, especially in terms of the safety of the property they let. Rhiannon Passmo. Uh, First Minister, figures released last week showed that 86,238 landlords are now registered, meaning an estimated 3,762 are letting properties illegally. Registering as landlords costs £33.50 if completed online and £80.50 on paper, and irrespective of the number of properties they have. <laughs> the scheme was launched on the 23rd of November 15, giving landlords 12 months to register before it became law last year. First Minister, isn't it time that all landlords Landlords followed the example of the vast majority and live up to their social obligations to their tenants, comply with the law and deliver decent housing conditions in Wales? And what can the Welsh Government do to aid bringing those who, for whatever reason, continue to flout the law? Well, I absolutely agree that those landlords who have as yet failed to come forward need to do that now. They are breaking the law. If landlords come forward now, they may escape any financial penalties for non-compliance. If they don't come forward now and are subsequently found out, then of course, uh, Rent Smart Wales could issue fines, take them to court for prosecution, and they even have the power to remove their ability to let or manage properties. So the sanctions are there. Hugely important that landlords avoid those sanctions by complying with the law. Question die, Janet Prince Saunders. Thank you. Uh, Will the First Minister make a statement on adult mental health services in Wales? Yes, improving mental health services continues to be a priority for the Welsh Government, and we have committed a further £40 million for mental health services over the next two years. First Minister, I'm really glad to see that you are increasing the resources um, you know, for those suffering with mental health problems. But what I'm finding in Aberconway is the interpretation of the Mental Health Act. And um, I know that many of my, our patients are finding this very hard to navigate when it uh, comes to support required. Uh, even myself, when I'm dealing on behalf of my constituents, it is really hard to ensure that statutory bodies are complying with this legislation, even down to treatment care plans. When you ask uh, the statutory partners responsible for a copy of the treatment and care plan, more often than not, we have to wait weeks for us to receive them. They've never, ever been written up in advance. Now, the, I'm talking about people with complex mental health conditions. What will you do as First Minister, please, to ensure that it's not just a case of throwing money at this, that strategic and well-intentioned plans are in place for these people who, you know, in some occasions are falling through the net and becoming you know, very, very vulnerable indeed? Well, uh, we do expect, of course, public bodies to comply with the law, but I can say she, she asks about uh, what structures should be in place. 
leaving aside the, uh, the issues of uh, the amount of money available. Our 10-year mental health strategy together, together for Mental Health takes a population approach to improving the mental well-being of people uh, in Wales and supporting people with a uh, mental illness. We want to make sure, for example, that people uh, can have access to talking therapies, for example. Uh, we're looking at ways, of course, uh, of helping young people even more, and she will be aware, of course, of the money that's been put in place for, uh, for CALMS. Uh, but we certainly expect, of course, uh, that where uh, public bodies are, are expected to comply with legislation, that they do so. Clean up your earth. Uh, um, First Minister, let me tell you about a 30-year-old uh, man who, after a mental uh, health crisis, presented himself to us. Betty Gwynedd was then transferred overnight, a six-and-a-half-hour journey to a hospital in the south-east of uh, England. His family was able to negotiate a handover to the home treatment uh, team, so after a week uh, he was returned home, but describes being accompanied back to his house, flanked by two guards, as embarrassing and traumatic. The whole experience, he says, left him feeling like a criminal and not a vulnerable patient. This is clearly unacceptable. So what action will the government take to um, address the shortage of mental health beds, not just in North Wales but throughout the country, and to uh, include investment in beds themselves and staff and also in home treatment teams? Well, well, the member uh, gives an example there that uh, deserves further investigation. Uh, it's very difficult to comment on it without knowing more about it, but if he wishes to write to me with more details, I would, of course, be uh, pleased to investigate that for him. He asked the question as well on mental health spending. Well, of course, mental health spending is ring-fenced in Wales, and we plan to increase that funding by a further £20 million, pounds, nearly £650 million pounds in 2018-19. Caroline Jones. Uh, First Minister, despite the mental health measure, nearly a quarter of patients in Wales wait longer than 28 days for a local primary mental health support services assessment, and 20% of those patients will wait more than 28 days for treatment following, following the assessment. In recent months, we have had warnings um, about insufficient consultant psychiatrists and problems recruiting sufficient psychologists. First Minister, what is your government go doing to improve recruitment of trained mental health clinical staff and put an end to lengthy delays in mental health treatment in Wales? Well, we have, of course, in place a recruitment uh, campaign, which has proven very successful. We put extra resources into CALMS when that was needed, when demand did become very uh, high and that demand needed to be uh, satisfied. Uh, I can say that more than 154,000 people have been seen by local primary mental health support services since their introduction as part of the implementation of the measure in 2012, and over 82,000 people have received therapeutic interventions by their LPM HSS. Uh, so we know that uh, many people have benefited from uh, that uh, measure, uh, and we can see, of course, uh, that uh, the uh, budget is ring-fenced for uh, mental health uh, to ensure that uh, sufficient resources are available. Question and our Gunnar Wayne were a play dear when the road played Andrew R. T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, um, tomorrow there will be a motion before the Assembly to, try, to ask the Assembly's permission to set up an inquiry by the Committee of the First Minister to scrutinise uh, the allegations that have been made about the time in office of Leighton Andrews and your special adviser, uh, Simon Jones. Um, I'm Stephen Jones, sorry. Um, I understand the Leader of the House will respond to that debate tomorrow, which is quite right, because it's, it's organising assembly business. But I'm just working out in my own mind, I'm sure many other people are trying to work out in their own mind, why the Government has tabled a delete-all amendment to that motion, and why you have an objection to the scrutiny of the First Minister Committee undertaking this piece of work on what certainly is not a political point, I would suggest. It is merely trying to get to the bottom of the allegations that have been made. Well, uh, I take the view that an independent process is the best way of doing that, and that's why we table the amendment that we have. Well, well surely scrutiny of the First Minister Committee is an independent uh, process. Uh, sit on that committee and look objectively uh, at the evidence that's given to the uh, committee uh, and ultimately determine and provide a report uh, based on that evidence. Uh, it was slightly alarming from the Consul General's interview on the politics show that he questioned the ability of the chair as, chair, as a Labour chair and Labour members to actually be objective in their scrutiny. I believe, I believe, 
I believe that they will act with integrity and objectivity on the evidence that is provided by the witnesses that would come before them. I have the words here which actually do say uh, about uh, in the Labour Chair and AMs to act impartially on the subject, which I have stated is clearly not a political subject. Those are the words I've got it here written in front of me, if the Secretary well, position wants said. to talk about. So I do, believe, I do believe that they would act objectively, and I do think it is important for this institution that if that vote is carried tomorrow, that the scrutiny of the First Minister's Committee is allowed to undertake that work. Surely that's what that committee actually does. And so I do ask you again to enlarge why you have put that delete-all motion down that will prevent the very committee that is charged by this Assembly to scrutinise you and your office and the activities of you and your office while in government. Well, he has been partial himself in the words that he has alleged the Council General used. That's the problem. It's, it's the committee is there to scrutinise me as First Minister. Of course it is. But I take the view, and I think reasonable people will take the view, that where there is an issue such as this, that an independent process is the right process to deal with the issue. Well, it is really regrettable to see that you are not prepared to have confidence in the committees of this Assembly to actually do the work that they are charged with doing and actually listen to the evidence that is given. But tomorrow, tomorrow there is a motion and there is an amendment. So whichever one carries, there will be an inquiry. Can you confirm that government ministers or government secretaries that will be given evidence to either one of those investigations will be relieved of collective responsibility and they can speak as individuals when asking the evidence, uh, when putting the evidence before the investigations? And above all, I'm not, I'm not sure how people will vote in this chamber tomorrow, but it could well boil down to one vote. These allegations are levelled at yourself as First Minister and the activities of the First Minister's office. Will you abstain yourself from voting in that vote tomorrow, given that it is specifically, specifically dealing with allegations, and I level this, allegations which need to either be proved or dismissed, and they are levelled at yourself as First Minister. Will you absent yourself from that vote? Well, I think by his comments today, the Leader of the Opposition has shown that it's highly political what he's trying to do. It's nothing to do with it being impartial at all. Uh, I saw his comments over the weekend when he said that he wants uh, an investigation up to the present day uh, for no apparent reason, and also he said that the committee should make recommendations about the running of the First Minister's office. It's not a matter for the committee as to how the Welsh Government is, is run in that way. I take the view. I am not afraid of an independent process. What's the point I'm not afraid of an independent process. I'm not afraid of an independent advisor looking as to, uh, as to whether I have breached the ministerial code, because I'm confident that I have not. I am not, I am not afraid of an independent process. I don't know why he is so afraid of an independent That's process. That's why I'm asking you to submit yourself. What about collective And when is Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood? Dear Llywydd, First Minister, mental health and children's mental health is one of the biggest issues facing uh, Wales at the moment. And on tw 27th of September last year, you claimed that investment would drive down waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services. And you said the resources have been put in and I fully expect the waiting times and the numbers to go down as those resources work through the system. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I do. Uh, it is right to say, for example, with CALMS, demand did outstrip uh, what was available. There's no question about that. And that's why we put the extra £8 million a year into uh, children and adolescent mental health services in order to, uh, to deal with that. And if we look at uh, the new funding that's been uh, announced for mental health, on top of the general increases, £22 million of new funding has been targeted at improving access to a number of specific uh, services. So £8 million a year for older persons' mental health, the £8 million I've mentioned for CALMS, £3 million a year for psychological therapies for adult services, £1.5 million a year for community perinatal services, and £1.5 million a year in local primary mental health support services to further support the, uh, the measure in 2012. Earlier this year, First Minister, Stats Wales changed the way that waiting time numbers were being reported, removing the cases that were regarded as non-CAMS pathways. This removed 1,700 children, some 74% of the total, from the waiting list in one fell stroke. That makes historic comparisons impossible, but we do now have seven months' worth of new data, which means that we can see what has happened so far this year. And it's clear that waiting times for CAMS are getting worse. Back in March, 87% of children were waiting less than a month. Now it's 45%. 
Back in March, no children were waiting longer than 16 weeks for that first appointment. Now, one in five children are. That doesn't sound like a driving down of waiting times to me. You've previously argued that there are too many children being referred for specialist treatment. Do you still think that the problem with CAMS is that too many children are being referred? Well, it is a fact that around 25% to one third of referrals to specialist CAMS are redirected to other services because the referral is inappropriate for what is a highly specialised service. Now, that's done to ensure that those children who require specialist support are able to receive it in a timely manner. Of course, we expect CAMS to deal with those young people who need help from CAMS, but we also know that many of those young people who are directed to CAMS in the first place are directed elsewhere to a service that's more appropriate for them. 74 per cent. When confronted by a, a long-standing problem, First Minister, it looks like the response of your government is to move the goalposts and to <coughs> manipulate the data, or to claim that not everyone really needed the service. Now, there are several uh, other examples where, rather than improve services, you've moved the goalposts. It happened with the ambulance service, the number of full-time GPs in the NHS last week. Cancer targets were changed, but we don't yet know what to, yet you still reject Plaid Cymru's call for a 28-day diagnosis target set by the Independent Cancer Task Force. Isn't it time we removed your government's ability to avoid scrutiny by moving the goalposts? And isn't it time that Wales established an independent body for setting targets and publishing the data against those targets? What will it take, First Minister, for waiting times in CAMS to be reduced so that children get the treatment that they need? Well, it, it comes as a surprise to me, uh, as I stand here every week, to suggest that I'm not scrutinised, uh, because I can guarantee members that uh, certainly I, I am. Can I, can I make a point? Statistics are not changed by government. They're, they're dealt with uh, independently, and it's up to the uh, statistics authority to decide how we gather statistics. It's not something that government uh, decides. Yes, it is true to say, with, uh, with ambulance response times, for example, that was changed, but that, that, put, that, that put it in a comparative position with England. That's the reason why, one of the reasons why that was, uh, was done. Uh, when it comes to looking at uh, cancer targets, these, these are the issues that, that we look at to make them more effective. The issue I always have with the 28-day diagnosis is that, is that specialists say to me it's often not possible to do that because of the nature of somebody's cancer. People react in different ways, and their diagnosis is done in different ways. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm just referring uh, to what people have said to me. Now, she makes the point about making sure that, that young people get the treatment that they need at the right time. And a priority of the Together for Children and Young People programme is to reduce inappropriate referrals, to examine the way in which specialist mental health services work with primary care and others in social services, education and youth justice in the third sector, to ensure that young people do have timely access to appropriate help. But of course, what is important is that young people, when they're referred, get the right level of service and not just get defaulted to CAMS. So this is a holistic approach that we're taking, and we're confident, if we take in, uh, into account as well the pilot projects that were announced in September for mental health support in schools, that we will then be able, of course, to ensure that more and more young people get the uh, help and support that they need. Arwenydd Group Ilkip, Neil Hamilton. Talking about Clare. Uh, well, the temperature in this chamber may rise tomorrow, but I wonder if the First Minister has seen that the Met Office forecast for outside show that we are likely to have sub-zero temperatures for the next week or two. Um, I wonder if he also saw on Monday in The Guardian that uh, there was a report saying that electricity and gas prices have risen in the last 20 years by three times the rate of inflation, and the average household now spends £562 a year on heating and lighting. What it didn't say was that this is overwhelmingly due to the rise in green taxes, which will cost households almost £150 a year from next year. And they've risen by two-thirds since 2014 and are now 20% of the typical electricity bill. Considering that a quarter of the households in Wales live in fuel poverty, how can we justify loading these charges upon the poorest and most vulnerable in society? This is a man who voted in favour of privatising uh, electricity Just answer and the gas. Question. That's the reason why prices have gone up. The fact is, there's no real competition. People don't really understand how to get the best uh, tariff, despite what uh, the, the, uh, people's best, uh, best endeavours to do that. In fact, the service was far better when, it was, uh, when we had a, 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 a nationalised 
provider. And that is something I'd like to see return in the future. It's nothing to do with green taxes. It's all to do with the fact that private companies make profits uh, uh, on the back of ordinary people, something he supported, and that, fa that party over there supports as well. Uh, uh, the First Minister, of course, did not answer the question. 5% of an electricity bill goes in profits to electricity companies, 20% in green taxes. So the First Minister is completely wrong. Uh, but however bad things are committed, things are going to get worse because the OBR forecasts, which accompanied the budget papers this year, show that environmental levies will rise from 10.7 billion this year to 13.5 billion by 2022. So that means green taxes will then be over 200 pounds per annum for the average electricity use and a third of power bills. The introduction of smart meters is going to add another 11 billion to that. That's an 80, 84 pounds a year extra for the next five years for every household. And also an extra two billion is going to be spend, spent on upgrading transmission lines and infrastructure <laughs> to cater for remote wind farms. That adds another 25 pounds per household. So I repeat my question, which the First Minister didn't answer the first time around. How can we justify loading these charges upon the poorest and most vulnerable in society? Well, I mean, first of all, I heard some rumbling from the party opposite about uh, you know, the, the overcharging of customers. In 2015, when my party stood in the general election, they accused us of being Marxists for wanting to put a price cap on energy prices. That's how much they cared for ordinary people. We all know what the Tories are like. Now, in answer to the question posed by the leader of UKIP, Every single method of generating energy costs money. Every single method. Nuclear costs a, a, a great deal of money as well. Now, yes, we do want to make sure that we have cleaner, greener energy. It's good for energy security. Why would we want to import energy from other countries when we can generate our own in a renewable way? Or is he saying that we should just have coal-fired power stations absolutely everywhere and more open cast? Because that is the, uh, the upshot of what he's saying. Refuses to answer the question: How do we justify loading poor people with these excessive charges, which are going to grow and grow with every year that passes? The OBR papers, uh, the fiscal supplementary tables uh, following the budget, show that the cost of the Climate Change Act in 2022 will be nearly 15 billion pounds a year, and over the next five years, people, the average uh, household, will be spending an enormous amount of its income on green taxes, £66 billion, £2,500 pounds per household over the next five years will be taken from household budgets in green taxes. Green taxes are driving poor and vulnerable people into the red. Well, he talks about driving poor and vulnerable people into the red. The privatisation of energy was one way of doing that. We, we know that. His party stood on a, a programme of a flat tax, which would increase taxes for the vast majority of poorer people no, and reduce them for, no, uh, for people who are earning more. So he's no position to, to lecture anybody else about uh, looking after poorer people. And let me ask him this. At the end of the day, he doesn't believe in climate change. That's, that's a, that I do, he doesn't. I look at the science, he doesn't. That's the, the way that he sees it. I believe that cleaning up the environment costs money. The UK was a mess in the 1980s. It was filthy. The River Irwell in Salford would catch fire if you threw a match into it. Where I live in Bridgend, the River Ogmore would run different colours according to what had been chucked into it by whatever industry it was up river. Nobody says to me, I want to go back to those days where the environment was degraded, where the rivers were polluted, where the air was polluted, but it seems to be something that he's more than happy to see again. Question three, Mohammed Ashka. Now, sir, what action will the Welsh government take to, take to enhance environmental protection in the next 12 months, please? Well, a, a very topical question, if I, if I may say. Well, through the Environment Act, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the creation of natural resources. Wales, we already have, of course, some of the most advanced environmental legislation and integrated enforcement arrangements in the world. Well, thank you for the reply, First Minister. No less than eight wildlife and the countryside charities in Wales have criticised cuts in the environment funding sets out in the draft budget. WWF Cymru said... There is an apparent gap between your pledges on the environment and the reality of what's happening on the ground, while others have questions whether the Welsh Government has provided sufficient resources to deliver legisl legislation such as the Environment and Wellbeing of Future Generation Acts. What message does the First Minister think this cuts in funding sense about his Government's commitment to protecting the environment in Wales. 
Well, if we look at the local authority environment and sustainable development single revenue grant, a total of uh, £61.79 million pounds has been allocated to the local authorities for 2017 to 18. Uh, that is something that is hugely important, on top of, of course, the uh, spending that will come from government. But again, I say to him and his party, he is in no position to lecture us about money, when yet again we have a budget that deprives Wales of money, that gives us a mere £200 million pounds for four years to, uh, to spend, where we end up in a position where we are 7% worse off in real... I know it hurts, but you've got to listen. 7% worse off in real terms since uh, 2010, where... When Northern Ireland got £1.67 billion, they made no representations at all for Wales. And where Wales is so insignificant in their thinking that the leader... And I'm going to feel sorry for him now. That the leader of the opposition is banned from sitting in the UK cabinet, even as his Scottish colleague is there. And there they are, sitting, lecturing us about standing up for Wales and making sure that we get more money from Wales. We'll do that. They will never do that. Simon Thomas. Uh, Gynnyddol y bobl yn poeni bod ni'n cadw uh, y cyfreithiau am gerlledol sydd yn ymddiffyn. Ar hyn i chi newid ysgrifio'r ffordd yn ni wedi gwella ar ymgylchydd yma yng Nghymru ac yn Prydain. Nawr, di llun uh, gebon y pwyllgod materion allanol fe dwetswch chi bod chi wedi paratoi bil parchad, ragofan uh, nad yw trafodaethau gyda Llywodraeth San Stefan yn llwyddo i ddaparu ar ymddiffyn yma, mae dyn ni'n chwilio amdano fe. Na dwi wedi teimlo byddai fe'n briodol i chi cyhoeddi i'r bil parhad yna ar ffyrdd draft nawr, fel arf cyhoeddus o'ch uh, ymwymiad a bwriad chi i sicrhau'r dyddfwriaeth yma'n parhau wrth ymadael ar unrhyw biopiau. Mae'n afael, uh, fi'n benderfynu fi yn un a phryd a uh, dylai'r bil yna gael ei gyhoeddi, a'r hyn o bryd beth hoffwn ni weld yw'r gwelliannau yn cael ei dderbyn gan uh, tîr gyffredin, os mwyn na'n wir byddwn i'n eisiau cael bil parhad, ond mae'n wir i wedi bod i'n wedi cael ei drafftio. <coughs> First Minister, the Welsh Labour Government has shown that through its proactive approach to regulation, enforcement and wider initiatives, great progress can be made to protect the Welsh environment. This is clearly evidenced in the Welsh Labour Government's proactive ambition for Wales to recycle 70% of all waste by 2025 and zero waste by 2050, with over 60% of our municipal waste in Wales currently being recycled. What further actions, therefore, can the Welsh Government take to enhance this fantastic and strategic achievement? Well, I pay credit to my colleague uh, Leslie Griffiths and uh, those who held positions before her. The fantastic work that's been done for recycling. Back in 2000, we recycled about 4% of, we, of waste arising uh, in Wales. Uh, there are uh, stretching targets uh, for the uh, future, but also... Uh, we need to work with others to make sure that the level of packaging is reduced. It's difficult to do it at a Welsh level because most of what comes into Wales is packaged and purchased elsewhere. But coordinated European action, indeed worldwide action, to reduce packaging in the first place would reduce waste arising and make it even easier for us to increase our level of recycling. Question Pedwar Julie Morgan. Uh, <coughs> what discussions has the First Minister held regarding plans to relocate staff from the Department for Work and Pensions Office in the Heath area of Cardiff? Well, the former Minister for Skills and Science met with Damien Hines, the Minister for Employment, to discuss the DWP's estate plans, and he agreed to keep the Welsh Government updated on any potential transfer of DWP functions from Gabalva and other locations to a new hub north of Cardiff. Um, I thank the First Minister for that uh, response. Um, I want to make the First Minister aware that um, a huge number of the staff at the DWP office um, in Heath, in my constituency, are absolutely filled with uncertainty and concern at the moment. And many of them are disabled, many of them have caring responsibilities, and some of them will have to travel up to three buses to get to the new location, um, not yet specifically specified in um, Nantgaro. Um, and this is where other um, staff will be relocated from other parts of Wales. Um, could he ensure that their concerns are conveyed to the DWP so that they are not left into this feeling of uncertainty about not knowing what's happening and what's going to happen about the fact that they're going to have to travel so much further and so for so much longer time, and many of them will not be able to take up the jobs in um, Nantgaro? Well, it's a matter of course for the DWP, but what, um, at that meeting, what was confirmed by the DWP Minister Involvement for Employment was they were looking to relocate staff from five DWP benefit offices to a, an office north of uh, Cardiff. 
Uh, it was said that uh, he, the Minister would keep Welsh Government uh, informed, but clearly it's hugely important that people know what is planned and, and know <coughs> what the future holds for them as quickly as possible. Gareth Bennett. Dear Clwyd, unfortunately we could end up with a large vacant site in North Cardiff to add to eventual vacant sites at the Tax Office and Tesco House. This could well lead to more contentious housing schemes for North Cardiff. What can your government do to protect residents from the problem of urban overdevelopment? Well, it's a matter, of course, for Cardiff Council to produce this local development plan, uh, ensure there's a five-year housing uh, supply, uh, and, uh, of course, that, uh, that plan is produced uh, in accordance with national planning guidance. Question Pimp, Mark Reckless. Uh, what assessment has the First Minister made of the prospects over the next four months <coughs> for first-time buyers in Monmouthshire? Well, providing opportunity for first-time buyers in Monmouthshire and across Wales has always been one of our key priorities. Home ownership is a significant part of our 20,000 affordable homes target, and Help Dubai Wales is supporting this with nearly three quarters of new homes purchased through the scheme being first-time buyers. First Minister, the average Help to Buy house price for first-time buyers in Monmouthshire is 240,000, similar to Gloucestershire across the border. Are you not concerned that if your government fails to match England's approach to first-time buyers, some of our young people will leave Wales and buy over the border instead? Well, um, I, I'm sure they will be attracted by the fact that council tax is substantially lower in Wales than it is in England under a Conservative government. But he asked the question about uh, stamp duty. Uh, we understand, of course, there will be a need to respond to changes to stamp duty policy following the UK government uh, budget. Uh, now the UK Government has announced a relief for first-time buyers, the Cabinet Secretary will give consideration to whether changes should be made to land transaction tax. Mick Antony. First Minister, one of the things that uh, first-time buyers in Monmouth share with those in Taffeli and Pontypridd uh, is the growth of leasehold properties. Properties being sold by leasehold, creating a whole series of financial issues in respect of ground rent and in respect of the subsequent uh, uh, reversions or the, when, the, when the periods of years begin to expire. Do you agree with me that the growth of leasehold, one, is unwelcome within Wales, but secondly, that we, the Welsh Government should give consideration to uh, barring or abolishing uh, leasehold properties for the future? Well, uh, there's been a great deal of exploitation of uh, leasehold where leases have come to an end. Of course, there are some areas, as, as uh, my friend will know, uh, such as um, apartments and flats where leasehold tends to be something fairly normal. When it comes to houses, however, uh, Wales has a history uh, where leaseholds have come to an end in the past where people have been uh, charged uh, large amounts in order to buy out the, the land on which their houses actually sit. Uh, and I think uh, in the future it's hugely important that, that freehold is the, uh, the tenancy that is, most, uh, that is normal as far as housing is concerned. There may be examples such as community land trusts uh, where that, that wouldn't be appropriate just to make sure that, that house prices are kept down. But yes, uh, certainly we want to do all that we can to ensure that people are not exploited when leases come to an end quite often after a period of more than a century. Question, where Paul Davis? I'm not sure if you have any questions. 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 The Ogelli and Covebion Travel, doing Kinabod, Velhan, or Gofire, Ravel be Cantabore, Swadreth, Hiwadi, Lancio Canthin Grant, Igevnogi, At Goerio, Hadu, Covebion Travel, Emma, Unghamri, and we are doing the Ashford Grantio, he that dig me lobin noither, Galo Dan, a Canthin, but see, Ashu Hidway of the Palm or Suyanis, a Mar Canthin, where he bought Hidden Hin, a heavy with a Fimod Lonum Ruimo, Gohoyvi, Dadan Sodia, do blame Ararian who knew where the Erbin, Belagasuni, well, would poor Prano Gumri, where the Elwa or Ariana. He did his young brother, Canthin, when he bought an in Suyanis Jos Ben, and he went sick at high. Uh, wrth gofio ar ffaith uh, bod uh, canmlwyddiant uh, 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 Rhyfel Cyntaf wedi bod uh, gyda ni dros y blynyddau diwetha, bod yn affordu sicrhau bod uh, cofebion yn cael i, uh, cael I, 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 I ail wneud i adnewyddu mewn ffordd uh, lle mae bobl yn gallu diallt beth, beth uno a, a bod yna bod yna ddigno fachter yn cael eu rhoi hefyd. 
Ni yn rhoi wrth gwrs arian i gadw, i cadw, e, e, mwyn sicrhau bod, um, bod arian y cyfal afdyn nhw hefyd. Uh, does dim uh, problem ddim uh, ynglyn â sicrhau bod, uh, bod yn y restr yn cael ei rhoi i, uh, i alodau ynglyn â blemau'r arian wedi mynd, uh, am fi'n siŵr y llwyn â gael ei wneud yn ein hyderus bod uh, y cynllu wedi bod yn llwyddiannus iawn. Don Bowden. Uh, first Minister, I've spoken many times uh, in the Chamber about the need to <coughs> capitalise on the industrial heritage of Merthyr Tydfil as part of a, an economic strategy for the, for the whole area. And I'm sure that you'll join me in thanking the organisers and the many es experts who recently gave their time at the industrial heritage charrette that was held in, the, in Cavartha Castle, which looked at new and innovative ways to... Um, uh, to, 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 to develop some of the incredible heritage sites and develop a, a unique attraction. Would you agree that in looking to protect <coughs> historic sites, we must find ways to protect the future of sites like the blast furnaces at Kevartha before we lose them forever and at the same time lose the potential, the, the op the potential opportunities that they bring to strengthen the local economy? I, I do, and I think the 2016... Uh the Historic Environment Act has placed us at the forefront of the UK nations in the protection and management of the historic environment, and a large proportion of that act has now been implemented. In addition, of course, as I mentioned earlier, CADU has allocated over £22 million in capital funding to support the maintenance of historic buildings and scheduled monuments in Wales since 2011, with revenue support for maintenance around £6.5 million. Uh, so there is money available, uh, and we want to make sure that we are able to protect as much of Wales' industrial heritage as possible. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on action that the Welsh Government is taking to reduce inequality in Wales? Yes, equality is central to the work of the Welsh Government and our vision for Wales as set out in Prosperity for All. Uh, our Strategic Equality Plan 2017-20 to sets out the steps we'll take to achieve our equality objectives and those objectives focus on tackling the most entrenched equalities in Wales. Uh, one of the entrenched inequalities in Wales is the disparity between the quality uh, of the health service and the timing of the health service uh, in North Wales versus other parts uh, of the country. Uh, why is it, First Minister, that uh, my own constituents have to wait, uh, are twice uh, as likely as constituents in Cumtaf Health Board, for example, uh, to have to be in a, a, an emergency department for four hours uh, or more? And why is it that in North Wales, patients, one in 11 patients, wait for 36 weeks or more from referral to treatment versus just uh, one in 83 down here in Cardiff in the Vale? This inequality is clearly unacceptable. I'm sure you would agree with me that that's unacceptable. What action are you taking to put this situation right, given that this health board is in special measures? Well, of course, uh, there will be differences between health boards. For example, uh, Betsy Cadwallader has historically been the best performing health board when it comes to, uh, to cancer. Uh, treatment in Wales, but there are disparities, and of course, as the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing is aware, we look to iron out those uh, disparities and uh, take action where that, is, uh, where that is needed. And where there is a need, for example, to recruit, we look to uh, recruit and work with uh, health uh, boards in order to, uh, to recruit the right level of medical staff they need in order to provide the service that we think is appropriate and right for the people who live in all parts of Wales. Rhiannon Pasmo, uh, First Minister, the Welsh indices of multiple deprivation suggests that households containing children have a higher rate of income deprivation than the overall population, with 24% of such households in deprivation compared with 16% overall. Members in this Senate are very well aware that universal credit, the single monthly payment which replaces the six current working age benefits, is being rolled out across Wales. Despite the outstanding and proactive work being undertaken in Wales to support, advise and assist those impacted by welfare reform, it is inevitable that universal credit will impact negatively on the lives of the most vulnerable people across our nation. So the operation of a process that seems designed to purposely push people into poverty and debt. What representations can the Welsh Government make to the Secretary of State for Works and Pensions to call on the UK Tory Government to rethink highly regressive and destructive policy? Well, the rollout of universal credit is a mess. People are left without money, people who need money on a weekly basis. Uh, people are left in a situation where they cannot afford to buy things. Uh, people are left in a situation of uncertainty. And we know that the UK government's response to all this is, who cares? Who cares, pretty much? Well, we care on this side of the chamber. We urge the UK government to make sure that uh, people who need that money 
get that money and they stop the cuts they're making to the benefit system and the cuts they're making to the spending that we as a society have historically made on those who are most vulnerable. And we will always stand for those who are most vulnerable. Question Oith, Jane Hutt. Will the First Minister provide an update on action taken by the Welsh Government to tackle violence against women and girls? Hey, could I congratulate the member for what I think is the first First Minister's question? Uh, that, she's, uh, that, she's answered, that she's asked, uh, and I hope that I'm, I, I'm able to, uh, to give her the, uh, an answer that's satisfactory to her. Well, we're implementing the national strategy which sets out our action to tackle violence against women and girls, and survivors' voices have to be at the forefront of this work. Uh, and in recognition of that, we are developing a national survivor engagement framework. Well, I thank the First Minister for uh, that answer to my first question to him. Um, I think it is shocking to learn this week that on average two women a week are killed by a partner or ex-partner in England and Wales. And yesterday I spoke at the Bowser annual Lighter Candle Multi Faith event at Llandaff Cathedral following a march from the offices of Llamai Housing Society. We raised awareness uh, for the, and support for the <coughs> International Day for Eliminating Violence Against Women and Girls. And I welcomed in, in my, my words in the cathedral the approach that Julie James is taking regarding tackling violence against women as everybody's business. That was the message yesterday. Can I pay tribute to Bauzo, who organised the event yesterday? They undertake pioneering work supporting women facing domestic abuse, forced marriage, trafficking and FGM, which we debated recently. And can the First Minister assure me that Welsh Government recognises the important of the Wales wide work of Bowzo. Yes, I am grateful for organisations such as Bowzo who do offer support to some of the most vulnerable members of the BME community. We have provided £446,000 of funding to Bowzo from the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Revenue Grant during this financial year. And officials have recently met with Bowzo service users as part of the survivor engagement framework. And I understand the Leader of the House and Chief Whip is due to visit Bowzo's Wrexham office next week. Angela Burns. First Minister, victims of uh, domestic abuse very often have to go into hiding or stay in shelters for an inordinately long uh, periods of time. If you look across the piece in Europe, countries such as Italy and Germany not only have much more direct and emphatic uh, laws about remo removing the abuser from the marital home rather than the abused, but they also take the view that if a family has been disrupted and a parent, very often a, a woman with children, um, has to go into hiding, rather than just leave them in shelters, they actually take them put them in a home and help them to build a new life, new schools, new permanency, put down new routes in a place of safety. Will you undertake on behalf of your government to look at what places like Italy and Germany do to see if we can actually bring that kind of groundbreaking uh, whole family view of to how we might help uh, somebody who is suffering and had to leave their home because of domestic abuse? Yes, I, I, am, I think it's important that we look at good examples across Europe. The, one of the issues, of course, we faced at one time was the, the wall we'd hit with, 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 with the devolution boundary and not being able to do as, as we want to do in order to make sure that, uh, that, that we can be as effective as possible. We know, of course, with the reserve powers model, there are greater opportunities now for us to develop the kind of legal framework that we would want. Uh, but certainly, as we develop the uh, cross-government delivery framework that will be complementing our national strategy, uh, looking at other countries and what they do in order to see what the best practice is will form an important part of feeding into uh, to what we will then uh, look to do in Wales. Sean Gwenllian. Mae cymorthu ferched bangor ar cylch yn fe tholaeth i yn hynod o bryderus yn sgil y son am integreiddio grant gwasanaethau trais yn erbyn merched cam drin domestig a thrais rhywiol i mewn i un grant cyfansawdd. Maen nhw'n bryderus y gall ar un peth a ddigwyddodd yn lloegr ddigwydd yma. Fe gollwyd 17 y cant o lochesu arbenigol a gof rhaid gwrthod treian o'r holl gyfeiriadau i lochesu oherwydd prinder lle. Fe ddigwyddodd hyn ar ôl i'r Llywodraeth yn Lloegr roi'r gora i glisnodi cefnogi pobl ring ffensio hynny yw fel arian ar wahân. Fedrwch chi warantu y bydd lefel ddigonol o gyllid ar gael ar gyfer darparu llochesu ar draws Cymru, os daw'r newid cyllidebol i rym yn 2018-2019. Dyna'n gwmws beth ni'n mwyn gweld, a beth ni'n ddim mwyn gweld y gwasanaeth sy'n yr hyn o bryd yn cael i leihau mewn unrhyw ffordd. Cwestiwn 9, Neil Hamilton. 
Clare. Will the First Minister make a statement on local authority managed car parks in Wales? Yes, local authority <coughs> managed car parks in Wales are managed by local authorities. <laughs> I thank the First Minister for that illuminating response. Uh, <coughs> It was recently revealed, <laughs> following a freedom of information request to all local authorities by the BBC, that uh, councils are making hundreds of thousands of pounds a year out of uh, parking, um, pay and display parking machines that don't give change. <coughs> Only six of the 22 local authorities were able to provide the information, but for them th this amounted to 650,000 pounds over three years. I is this not an abuse? And should not the, these profits go back into uh, the development of uh, car parks or related services to improve parking facilities in towns? At the minute, there's no statutory requirement for local authorities to do that. But where profits are being made in this way, so that they're not just going to be a rip-off on the motorists, shouldn't the money be used for related purposes? Well, three things. I think, first of all, technology has progressed to the point where uh, any new machines, I think, should be. Uh, not just uh, coin machines, but machines where people can use apps to park, uh, or indeed machines where people can use their card to, to pay. Now, uh, I'm fortunate to live in a very progressive Labour, Labour Control Authority in Bridgend, where uh, that is possible in, uh, in the car parks. And indeed, they have a policy where parking is free in the multi-storey for the first two hours, uh, showing that they deliver uh, for the people of, of Bridgend. Uh, bear in mind, of course, that any money raised from uh, car parking does go back into local authority coffers uh, for the benefit of the local community. But I do take the point. I do believe that as uh, new machines are replaced, they should offer people the option of a, a number of ways to pay, whether it's by phone, by app or by chip and pin. Finally, question 10, Jane Bryant. Will the First Minister provide an update on the recruitment and retention of staff in the social care sector? Well, our social care workforce delivers a vital public service, and to ensure the sector is sustainable, we're taking forward actions, including tackling zero hours contracts and low pay, registering workers, and developing career pathways. And that will help to raise the status and profile of workers so social care becomes a positive career choice. Thank you, First Minister. Social care workers do an outstanding job. With an ageing population living longer, many with complex needs, we know that it's crucial to ensure that we have a workforce ready for now and in the future. Recently, one of my constituents who has worked in care homes for many years has decided to take a job in a fast food chain. The long hours, poor pay and difficult working conditions have left her with no choice but to leave the career that she loves. While I'm pleased the government's commitment to implement an accredited qualification for carers, making this a reality is key to stopping people like my constituent, a dedicated and skilled social care worker, leaving the profession. Could the First Minister provide an update on how far these plans have been developed? Yes. I mean, first of all, we provided £19 million of recurrent funding for local authorities to work with their service providers to help uh, manage the impact of implementing the, the national living wage, which we wanted to see. What have we done? Well, we've brought forward regulations to improve the terms and conditions of the workforce, requiring providers to provide more transparency in their use of zero hours contracts, to offer workers a choice of fixed hours contracts after a three month period of employment, and to clearly delineate between travel and care time. Uh, we extended the register to domiciliary care workers on a voluntary basis from 2018, ahead of the mandatory registration from 2020. And that's an essential aspect of ensuring the professionalisation of the workforce uh, so we can have social care workers that are appropriately qualified to deliver quality care to the vulnerable in our society.